We heard the uh, story earlier today from Mark chapter 15 and, and 16, a familiar story to us. Easter Sunday, the, the stone was rolled, Jesus was raised from the dead, and Mark ends his original story, either it got lost or he ended it with this strange last verse, a verse 8. It's in your bulletin outline if you'll take a look at it again. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That's not a great ending to the Easter story. There's no seeing Jesus. There's no hope in their hearts. But we can identify with this, this part, this chapter, that doesn't end with hope, but it ends with, begins with fear. Fear in our own stories. We all have fear at different times in Fear leaves little room for Easter hope. We're too concerned protecting ourselves, hiding, conserving ourselves. But there is another chapter to the Easter story. The Gospels go on to talk about how the fact Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus appeared to many, including the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul encountered the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus in the, in the Acts of the Apostles. And there... Jesus saw Paul face to face and Paul was changed. And because his life was changed, he committed the rest of his life to telling people about the benefits of the resurrection and the hope that is ours in Christ. In chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Paul's letter to the Romans, he makes a case for the benefits of the resurrection, the hope of Easter. This morning I'd like to focus my remarks on the hope of Easter around those, uh, some great nuggets from Romans chapter 8. So if you'll uh, stay in this outline with me and, and uh, fill in the blanks, we can discover for ourselves the hope of Easter. The first is that Easter redeems our past, present, and future. Easter redeems our past, present, and future. The ultimate story of hope is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus' resurrection was life out of death, brought joy out of sorrow, healing out of brokenness, meaning out of suffering. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, verse 20, in chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that in all things, you might underline all things there, get your pen out, pencil, underline all things. We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. The all things include our past that can plague us, our past that can be full of regrets. We're weighed down by disappointment, pain, discouragement, heartache, but because of Easter, our past can be redeemed. Our past becomes an opportunity for us to experience God's forgiveness and to have a new start because God is at work in all things. Even our pain, even our past becomes an opportunity for us to, to, understand, to create, a, have a, a, create an, a new understanding and compassion and empathy, empathy for others in our own lives. Part of the all things are our present. Our present can plague us because of our anxieties. We think about what's happening in our own lives or around us, people's expectations, our relationships, our children, the economy, rapidly changing culture. The present can plague us because of our anxiety, but it also gives us an opportunity to have faith in the one who is always at work in our lives. Have peace knowing that there's one who is a risen Lord who can always be present in our lives. That God is at work even in the grave of our own lives, bringing out new life. Part of the all things that God is at work doing is our, our future. Our future can plague us because of our fear. What's going to happen next year? What about our kids' first year at college? What about the job market? What about my friend who is plagued with fourth stage cancer? What's going to happen? The future can plague us. But the future is also an opportunity for us to hope in a God who is alive and at work in all things to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In saying that, I'm not saying that everything works out fine because we believe in Jesus. Because we know that's not true. Right? 
Stuff happens. Who has that bumper sticker? Who's seen that bumper sticker? Who lives that bumper sticker? Stuff happens, right? And for Christians, stuff happens. It isn't that everything will work out okay. That's not a promise of the resurrection. The promise is that God works all things together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That means moment by moment, we can be aware that God is at work in spite of whatever we're experiencing today. Whatever we experience in the past or in the future, God is at work. And part of the Christian life is maturing in our ability to see how God is at work in our lives and in the lives of others. Henry Nouwen says, it's essential to be able to discern from moment to moment how God acts in human history and how the personal, communal, national, and international events that occur during our lives can make us more and more sensitive to the ways in which we are led to the cross to our own salvation, our own forgiveness, and through the cross to the resurrection where we find hope and meaning. Easter redeems our past, our present, and our future because God is at work. And Easter reminds us that we were bought at an unspeakable price. Easter reminds us that we were bought at an unspeakable price. Before Easter, there was Good Friday. And before Good Friday, there was Monday Thursday. And Monday Thursday was when Jesus shared the Last Supper, the Passover meal with his disciples and gave it new meaning. His body broken, his blood poured out for the forgiveness of their sins. He washed their feet, demonstrated to them the full extent of his love. And then he was betrayed by a friend, arrested. And on Friday morning, Good Friday, Jesus was tried and then beaten and by 3 o'clock, he died on the cross, a horrible death as a criminal. By 6 o'clock, he was laid in a borrowed tomb. His death was for us. The weight of our sin was on him. He paid the penalty for our sin so that we could be brought back into a relationship with God, so that he could bridge the gap between us and God. It was a demonstration of God's love. Jesus laying down his life for us. It's something that we often get a glimpse of in human life, but believe and understand more fully as we understand what Jesus has done for us. Last weekend was a really big weekend for our family. Connor got married to Sherry Ann, and they surprised me last night for my 50th birthday by coming and coming to Easter Sunday. So Connor and Sherry Ann are right here. So give them a big hand. <laughs> Woo, yeah. So they've been married a week. They've been married a week. And guess what? Marriage is awesome. <laughs> huh, right? Thumbs up? Yeah. Okay, marriage is awesome. At the, re at the reception last weekend, his twin brother, uh, Brendan, was uh, the best man. And they've been partners for life. Nobody's been closer to either one of them than their twin brother. Matter of fact, uh, Brendan uh, illustrated that by telling the story of how they lived together for almost a year and how they lived in really close quarters and, and there was a lot of friction, a lot of pushing back and forth. Finally, Brendan came out first and then Connor was born. <laughs> so kind of told that story, which kind of demonstrates how close they were. But he also told a very uh, touching story, two stories of how Connor saved his life. We were in Costa Rica one year, and uh, Connor and Brendan were out in the surf, and Brendan had a surfboard, and Connor had a boogie board, and, and, Con and Brendan, uh, a wave hit him, and uh, he lost his surfboard and got caught by the rip current and was taken out. And, you know, as parents, it's hard to know the difference between this signal that says, hey, we're having a lot of fun. And this signal that says, hey, I'm drowning, right? <laughs> so Connor was closer to him and knew that he was in trouble. So he paddled over and uh, invited him onto the boogie board, gave him a fin, and they paddled in together. And then last summer, they were on their graduation backpacking trip, and Brendan hurt his knee, and they had 25 miles yet to hike. And, and Connor helped by carrying his weight so they could get out safely. Now... That's a, a glimpse, that's an image of the kind of love that we see in Jesus that is kind of awesome to us, right? When we have people who give of themselves, they're willing to risk themselves, sacrifice of themselves. A parent to a child, a, a brother to his brother, a friend to a friend. 
But how much greater is the love that God had for us that while we were yet sinners, while we were powerless, God sent Jesus to die for us. Paul says, He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will God not also give us all things? So what are the all things that Jesus' debt bought for us? The all things is the new life that God wants to give to us. Just as we're forgiven by Jesus' death on the cross, so we'll be raised with Jesus in our own resurrection. Our future is resurrection. Our future is experiencing a new heaven and a new earth through faith in Jesus. But the new creation has already begun. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone. The past is gone. And the new has come. God is already at work in us, making us new, giving us new hope, new love, new forgiveness, new perspective, new meaning that helps us deal with life. Not just in the future, but right now. Because God is giving us all things and making all things new. Because the love of God makes all things new, third, Easter redefines how we live today. Paul writes in Romans 8, 37, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of the resurrection, nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's amazing. Because of the resurrection, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Maybe you've already heard it this morning, but I want to say it again. Because of the resurrection, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So you fill in the blank. What are the things that we think could separate us from the love of God? Our sin? Nope. Our disappointment? Nope. Death? Nope. Divorce? Nope. Not getting that college acceptance letter? Nope. Bad grades? Nope. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so we begin to live in love, right? Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, when was the last time you loved someone with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength and didn't receive love in return? Well, maybe once or twice, but not for very long. Because when we're called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, God pours his love into our hearts. That's why we gather together for worship, to celebrate God's love and the fact that he has paid the price for us to experience his love. We gather together to worship, not once a year, but every week, often as possible, for us to experience the love of God together, to encourage our hearts so that we go to bed with the, with the knowledge and the security that we sleep in the love of God. And we wake up in the morning knowing this is a new day with all the challenges, but nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. How else do we do it? How else do we live except to know that we are embraced by the love of God? But Jesus also said, love your neighbor as yourself. Those aren't two disparate commandments. That's one commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. What happens is we are enveloped in the love of God. We live in the love of God. We live in the security of God's love. And as his love flows into us, then it flows out to us to people we love and people that we don't love. People who are hurting and broken. People who need a word of encouragement. That's not by accident. That's how God designed it. God designed a people to know him and love him, to be in relationship with him in order to make a difference in the world that God created and that he loves. N.T. Wright, in his book, Simply Christian, says, our future beyond death is enormously important, and I agree. I don't want anyone to leave today not knowing that because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we have the hope of eternal life. Our future beyond death is enormously important, but the nature of the Christian hope is such that it plays back into the present life. We are called, here and now, to be instruments of God's new creation. The world put to rights 
which has already been launched in Jesus and of which Jesus' followers are supposed to be not simply beneficiaries, but also agents. The purpose of Easter is not for us to get together and feel happy and then to leave unaffected. The purpose of Easter is for us to come together and realize that we're not only beneficiaries of this salvation, not only beneficiaries of this forgiveness, not only beneficiaries of this love, but we're also agents of the new creation of God that he wants to see take place right now. That's why we go to Mexico. We're going to a place where there is little hope and where the love of God can be demonstrated so tangibly. We're going to help change people's lives through the love of God. And guess whose lives get to be changed? Ours. Whether you stay behind and pray and give or you go with us, to build a house, we get to be agents of God's new creation in those places where they're wondering what happened to all those Christians who used to come down and build houses and now aren't coming because of violence or whatever fears. What happened? Half as many houses were built last year because we didn't go. That's why we go to Mexico. That's why, we're, that's why we canceled worship services in February, went out into our community and served the community and Amy and I are going to Disneyland tomorrow. Yes! <laughs> That's why we're joining with hundreds of churches all around the county in a season of service that goes from uh, April, beginning with Sleepless San Diego at the rescue mission, to, uh, to the end of the summer before the Luis Palau City Fest, which you'll all hear about. But we're joining with churches all around the county to do in five months what we did on one Sunday, to demonstrate to government leaders and institutions and schools and to nonprofits, to our neighbors, that God is alive and God loves them and God is doing a new creation through his people. Amen? Amen? That's why we get together to worship and to be in small groups together, to encourage each other to be a part about, about the new creation that God is doing in the world and that we get to be a part of. And we don't want to miss out on the opportunity for our lives to be changed. So I want to ask you for two commitments today. Here's two opportunities. I'm getting excited. This is the last message. So we, we, we don't have another service to go to. We can go a long time. <laughs> Are you ready, choir? Let's get serious here. Two choices. Here's two choices for us that I hope you'll all take me up on this, this because I'm going to make these choices today too. One is to establish and nurture our relationship with God through Jesus, through the risen Savior. To decide today that we're going to be serious about establishing a relationship with God through Jesus and nurturing that relationship so that it grows so that's not stagnant. So it's not just a name only. I'm a Christian. So what? I want to be a, a follower of Jesus where my life is growing in him, where I'm being challenged to do things I've never done before. And the second thing is for us to be committed to being a part of the new creation that God wants to do in the world through us. Anybody for that? Want to raise your hand? Choir? <laughs> choir, the first time I said choir, like two people had their hands up. I said, come on, I'm preaching to the choir here. Raise your hands. Come on. Okay, who... Who's in with it with me? Come on. Who wants to do that? So what if we all do that? Come on. Let's get serious. Jesus didn't die and was raised again so that we could have a fun Easter brunch. That's not why. Jesus died and was raised again so that we would have life. And so we would share that life with the world. So that we'd be changed. So that he continued to do his good work in us. The last word is not fear and trembling. Running away. The last word is that we serve and love a living and reigning Savior now and forevermore. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for your great love for us. It's amazing. It's awesome. We can hardly fathom it. Thank you that there's nothing that can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. And so we commit ourselves to be in Christ Jesus. To commit ourselves is people who have known you for a long time and people who have known you just for a short time, to commit ourselves to establishing and nurturing a relationship with you where we learn more and more about what you're doing in our lives, where we are not hopeless people, we're not afraid, but we know that you are working all things together for good because we love you and we called according to your purpose. We thank you that you redefine how we look at our lives today, that we can enter into our lives with your love, and be a part of what you're doing in the world. We don't have to wait for eternity to experience a new creation, that we can be a part of your new creating work in our own lives and the people around us. 
We commit ourselves to you this morning. Use us. Shape us. Take the brokenness and the pain and disappointment and hurt and sin of our lives and bring healing and wholeness and hope. Save us. Release us. Send us out to be your people. And we will say, hallelujah. Amen.